appreciate the way you are sensitive to the Spirit and lead us in worship. Are you grateful for how God has blessed us with the musicians and the singers that we have? Uh, you know, like Jason said, how it moves him when he hears his daughter sing, and he compared that to the way it moves God when, when God hears us sing. It reminded me of a scripture um, that uh, tells us, lets us know what God thinks about you and what he does for you. Uh, Zephaniah 3 verse 17 says, Yahweh, your God is among you. He is a warrior who saves, who he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will bring you quietness with his love. He will delight in you with shouts of joy. Some versions uh, even say that he sings praise over his children. So think about how God loves you in such a way that he sings praise songs over you. He rejoices over you in such a way. And, and, and it's only right that we should, in turn, rejoice over Him, isn't it? It's only right that because He first loved us, that we love Him, that He compels us into love. He draws us into love. And He changes us from who we were to who we're going to be and who we are in Him, right? Amen? All right. So um, before I get started in the message that... Uh, that uh, I feel like the Lord put on my heart this morning. I'd like for us to pray together if we can. Father, thank you for uh, our time together this morning. Uh, thank you for the time of worship that we have had, the time of learning that we had in our classes earlier. Uh, it, it draws us closer to you, God. It endears our hearts to you. Those that are hungry and thirsty will be filled uh, those that desire you, you will meet the desires of our heart. Those that chase after you, you will see to it that you're caught by them. Uh, and Lord, we, I just thank you for your, your everlasting, eternal love for all of us, no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter how much wrong we have committed. God, when we make an about face and turn to you, you're standing there with open arms to receive us, to cleanse us, to help us. And God, we thank you for that. We thank you for the love that we have from you. I thank you, God, for the love that we have from our brothers and sisters here in this church. And it's your love through them and that, that we freely give away. And we thank you for it in, all in Jesus' name. And I ask you, Lord, that you anoint my heart, my mind, my words today. Let them be yours, not mine. Let me hide behind the cross of Jesus Christ. Let, let no one look to me or hear anything from me, but from your spirit, God, speak to the hearts of every man, woman, and child in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So over the last couple of days, I know uh, we've been uh, thinking about, hearing about, and contemplating to some degree at least, hopefully to a, a, a good degree, healthy degree, uh, about it being Memorial Day weekend. And what do we do on Memorial Day weekend other than the celebrations and the things where we get together with our families? But the core reason of course, is to uh, remember uh, those that have sacrificed everything uh, to the point of even their very lives for the freedoms that we enjoy. And, um, and so I know some of you in here have lost uh, loved ones in service of one kind or another, in service to the country, in service to their fellow Americans, and maybe they were taken way too young. Um, I, I can never look at the picture of the young soldiers in the boat about to go on the uh, island of Iwo Jima knowing that 90% of them would not survive the next few minutes um, and some of them not even 18 years old yet but willingly fighting and doing what they did for our country and not just that group of men but so many countless others down through the decades and the, the centuries uh, since we've been a nation all the way back to uh, George Washington, um, that sacrificed uh, untold things that you and I could be uh, free in a country, that we could, that we could uh, get a job and make money and go shop and have fun and go you know, take vacations and all the things that, that we seem to sometimes uh, take for granted. I heard a, uh, a, a guy who's a, a veteran 
um, talking about Memorial Day, and something he said um, uh, kind of rang true with me and, and put something in my heart to, to talk about with you today. Um, he said, you know, have your get-togethers, do your barbecue, have your family, you know, come together and your friends and celebrate and celebrate what we have been blessed with as a nation. Don't forget God. Don't forget those who sacrificed that we could have what we have as a nation. So go ahead. By all means, have your celebrations and, and do it in remembrance of those that have, have passed on before, uh, that fought for your right to be able to do just that. But he also said something else that, that struck me, and he said, he said, but I think the most important thing is that you live your life worthy of the sacrifice that was made for you. And I, I thought about that. And I know there's some scriptures, and I'm going to ask you to turn to a couple of them here in just a minute, but that we live our life worthy of the sacrifice. We don't take sacrifices that people make for us for granted, whether they be small or whether they be very large, uh, you know, to the point of their own life, that they would lay down their life for us. You know, the scripture even says, no greater love does any man have that one would lay down his life for his friends. Now, of course, one way and, and the ultimate way of laying down one's life would be, you know, if you went to war or took a bullet for somebody or saved somebody from a, a, a train or a speeding vehicle or whatever, that, that you laid down your life literally for that person. But other ways of laying down our life are, are ways like where we would deny ourselves, where we would uh, maybe not enjoy certain pleasures or things that we perhaps could um, if it weren't for the fact that we are uh, conscious of the sacrifices made by others, that we were grateful of, of what has been given to us, so grateful that, that we want, Tammy, to, to give it to somebody else, that we want to con convey that to them, and that we would make a decision once and for the rest of our lives that we choose to live our lives worthy of the sacrifices that were made for us. Now, the sacrifices don't stop and didn't stop uh, just at the ones who uh, were fallen soldiers or, or uh, workers of whatever kind in whatever industry uh, that literally sacrificed their lives. It didn't stop there. The sacrifices go all the way back and the ultimate sacrifice, and you know what I'm about to say, the ultimate sacrifice of all time from all men for all men was a sacrifice that Jesus made when he lived his life that he could have been put on a throne. He could have been revered by men. He could have had the accolades of all around him. They tried to make him king, literally king, and he ran from it. He moved from it, but that wasn't his calling. His calling was to lay down his life for his friends. His calling was to pursue holiness, to live in holiness in the form of flesh that he could have made mistakes. He could have committed sins because he was a man subject to the, to the same lusts and the passions and the desires that any of us are. Could have fallen, but yet had such a love for his fellow man and fellow woman, had such a love for the world that he chose to lay down his life. He chose to walk away from the comforts. He chose to walk away from the peace that he could have had. He chose to walk away from the life that he could have had, to lay that life down, to set it aside, to put it on hold, to say, if I, if I choose to live for myself, a world dies in sin. But if I choose to live as my Father has sent me here to live, a world experiences or at least has the opportunity to experience not only life, but an abundant life. And then he, he gives that message over to us, J.D. He, he, he gives us that same commission that he gave his disciples standing there before him that day, just before he was taken up to be with the Father and, and to be seated, as we, as we know and read in the Scripture, at his right hand of authority. Just before that, he gives them this commission to go to every one that I put you in contact with. Go to all of your world, wherever your world might be, 
whether your world right now is at home with small children, whether your world right now is at a, is at a salon doing hair and nails, whether your world is over an air conditioner or over a two by four or whatever it may be, wherever your world is, wherever you're called to, you're called, you're given a commission to be a light to the people that you stand in front of. You're given a commission to live a life worthy of the sacrifice that was made for you. That word worthy, I looked it up this morning, that word worthy in the Greek is axios. I love it when Greek words are easy for me to pronounce. It makes me look smarter. <laughs> and I'm probably saying it wrong. It, it, Greeks, would, Greeks would be laughing at me right now. But anyway, it, it, it's axios, and it has its root. It has its root meaning uh, in balancing the scales. Right there where it's talking about being worthy of the calling. Balancing the scales. It has its root meaning. In, in other words, what has been put on this side of the scale and brought the scale down, such as uh, the life of Jesus, the life of the disciples, uh, the, the, the cost of the presentation of the gospel to the world, needs to be balanced on this side of the scales with equal weight. So to live worthy of the call, let's go ahead and turn there to that scripture. Ephesians 4, there's a couple of them that I want you to look at. So to live worthy of that call, either worthy of your calling or worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, is to put equal amount of weight on this side of the scales that was originally initially put on this side of the scales. And you say, now wait, wait, wait a minute. I can't be Jesus. Well, I'm not asking anybody to be Jesus. Well, I can't be perfect. Neither am I asking you to be perfect. Well, I can't produce all the kind of things that it would take to put the same amount of weight on this scale. Well, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can we? Can't we? If, if the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead, you know where I'm going, you've read the Scripture, <laughs> dwells in you, it will give life to what is mortal, it will, it will raise from the dead what has been dead, what has deceased. It will give it life. It will give it the ability. It will give it an abundance. It will give it the power. It will give it the direction. It will give it everything it needs to live a life worthy of your calling and worthy of the gospel. So Paul says to the church at Ephesus, and this is the fourth chapter as we broke down his letter, Therefore I, the prisoner for the Lord urge you, so he's talking to you, wasn't just to the church at Ephesus then, it's to the church at Cottontown now. So he says, I urge all of you Cottontown ears and rednecked people and all the such as the like. Now I'm just, you know I'm making that up, right? Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling that you have received. Work Live and walk worthy of the calling that you've received. Now, listen to the rest of it. With all humility, with all gentleness, with all patience, accepting one another in love, diligently keeping the unity of the Spirit with the peace that binds us. Now, where else do we see in Scripture that it tells us that we can have gentleness and peace and meekness and these sorts of things? Well, Galatians, but what is, what is was it talking about there in Galatians? The fruits of the Spirit. So, so this is not something that you necessarily have in and of yourself to produce because some of us just don't have it when it comes to patience. So, what? My wife is laughing. I t oh, boy, here we go. Some of us just don't have it when it comes to certain things, but, but we can have it, Shannon. We can be free of whatever thing that binds us if we desire it, if we want it, if we yield ourselves to the Spirit to allow Him to move and work in us. And then He causes circumstance to arise that exposes what is still yet on the inside of us that is not yet like Him. And rather than be angry with the circumstance, we say, thank you, Lord, for using this circumstance to expose what was in my heart. I choose now, because I see this is not like you, I choose now to surrender this all to you. 
I choose now to lay this anger at your feet. I choose now to lay this impatience at your feet. I choose now to lay this judgment at your feet, this bitterness, this, this resentment that I have felt. Whatever the thing may be, I'm making a conscious choice because I'm one of His. He speaks to me. He leads me. He guides me. He, he, he speaks to me through His Word. He speaks to me in my prayer. And He shows me when there's something in me that's not good or not right. And it's my choice then to surrender it's my choice then to obey. And we can do like I had them sing that song, say, I surrender all, all to you, Lord. I choose to surrender. Or we can say, you know what? I kind of like my anger right where it is. We literally had a guy say that one time at a Bible study when, when, when I was teaching on anger on a Wednesday night. He left angry and said, I don't know why we can't just have a Bible study. Why do we have to talk about anger? I like my anger right where it is. Well, you're going to be tormented for a long time then if you like your anger, if you like your lust, if you like your greed, if you like your impatience, if you justify it. When I was a young man, which was a long time ago, when I was a young man, I liked my anger. It served me well. I could keep people at bay with my anger. I could make people do things that I wanted them to do with my anger. And all I had to do was lash out every once in a while and maybe prove to them and with some physical means that I was serious and that they had to do what I, you know, and it served me. It served my pride. It served my flesh. It made me feel bigger and better than I was. And then one day I got to looking at this and I was like, wait a minute. This is not what God would want from me. This is not what he wants to see stay in one of his servants. And, 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 and I, began to, I began to seek him with everything that was in me. God, I don't want this in here. Why am I doing this? Why am I living? Why, why do I continue in this, expecting that there's going to be a sacrifice or grace that would cover something that I choose to continue in? And the scripture is clear that tells us there's no grace for those things that we choose to continue in. And so then there, we're back to the point, Chris, where we got a choice to make. I'm going to keep doing the things and living the life and feeling the feelings and having the stuff that I like and that I want and that serves me and that serves my flesh. Or at some point I'm going to say, I choose to live a life that's worthy of the calling that is on my life. I choose to live a life with patience and gentleness and meekness. I choose to live a life surrendered to the Spirit. I choose to live a life that says I'm going to put Jesus first and what He wants first and what He says first and what I think and feel don't matter anymore. And shouldn't we come to that place? Don't we bear some responsibility? I'm not talking about works. I'm not talking about trying to be holy by my own strength. I'm talking about no works. It's called surrender. It's called stop kicking and stop fighting and stop trying to do it yourself. It's called total surrender. Say, God, purge me, cleanse me, do in me. And it's going to make me go to an altar where I lay on my face. It's going to make me cry out and say I'm unworthy. It's going to make me say I'm no good. It's going to make me say I can't do this. I'm not asking you to do something you can do. I don't want you to do something you can do. I want you to let him do something in you that only he can do. And that comes after surrender, church. That comes after a choice that, that, that we wake up one day and we say, I choose to live a life worthy of my calling. Now, there's more in this chapter, but let's skip over to another book where Paul was writing to the church, uh, the Philippians. While you're turning there, it's go, oh, by the way, it's going to be Philippians chapter 1 uh, toward the end of the chapter. Um, excuse me, I, I said chapter 1, I meant chapter uh, 4. While you're turning there, let me read something that, that I wrote this morning as I was praying about today and, and, and what the Lord would have me to share. Um, about the worthiness of the, the axios, that was the first thing, the root meaning, meaning balance the scales. 
uh, what's on one side should be equal to what's on the other side. Live a life that shows the value. We should live a life, Brother Mark, that shows everybody around us, when they see me and they hear me talk and they see my actions and my responses and my reactions to things, it should reflect the value of what Jesus has put on the inside of me. And it will reflect how I value it or how much I value it or how much I don't. My actions and responses could, could show you just exactly how much I don't value the sacrifice that was made for me. It could show you that I have a very flippant attitude about it. And I've seen a lot of Christians like this, and I'm fixing to step on some toes, so get ready. Take your shoes off, unless you have a problem with foot odor, and then leave them on. But uh, it, it, I've seen people, that but they, they take a very uh, nonchalant attitude about uh, the, the cleansing and the purging process, and they want to they think that, hey, this is just the way I am, and nobody's perfect. You've heard me say this before. And, and, and I shouldn't expe- be expected to be perfect. And if I try to be perfect, it'd be my work. So, I, hey, I am just who I am. And you just got to deal with it. And, and that's not an attitude of a sold-out Christian. The attitude of a sold-out Christian doesn't say, hey, I'm this way, and it's just the way I am, and God loves me just the way I am. That's not the attitude of a sold-out Christian. The attitude of a sold-out Christian would say, I am who I am, but there are things in me that are not pleasing to my Savior And I want to live a life pleasing to Him, worthy of His gospel, worthy of the calling that He's put on my life. So these things that are there that don't look like Him and that don't look like this Word, I want them gone. And He and only He can do this. So my job today is to fully and completely surrender to Him and allow Him full access to every part of me. Let Him go in every room of that old dark heart of mine. Let Him expose everything. Let Him him come out with every little detail of there's resentment here, there's hatred there, there's malice there, there's guile here, there's gossip here, there's whatever it is, there's there's crudeness or foul language or whatever. There's, There's behavior that is unbecoming of a Christian because we know what the pattern is supposed to look like. And God, I want, you, I want you to deal with every bit of it. I want you to deal with every bit of it. I've heard the story, uh, whether it actually happened or it was just a story I heard about the prostitute that came in church one day. Y'all ever heard that story? The prostitute comes in church and, and she's got the skirt up to here and the top down to here and she's just, just the way she dresses and she gave her heart to the Lord and... And she got saved. There was conviction, and there was, you know, all the, 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 the and, and, and people said, you know, well, now, now, you know, she, she shouldn't be in church because she dresses like this. Well, you know what? After a period of time, your dress wear is going to change. Now, maybe not that first day. Maybe you got to save some money and go buy some longer clothes. But after a period of time, your dress wear is going to change. You're not going to want to show everything you've got because you know what it could be causing for other people around. It could be a stumbling block to people, and you don't want to be that shameless kind of thing going on. You, you, want, to, you, you want to change. After a period of time, that old rough, coarse, foul language that you used to have, that I used to have back when I was an early young man in construction, that old coarse stuff, I first got saved, Brother Mark, a lot of that was still there. But because I was saved, I didn't want it there anymore. And God began to help me in my effort, with my effort, get all that junk out of me. And it began to stop. And I've had friends who had a problem with whatever substances. And because they got saved, they wanted that part of them healed and delivered. They continued to pursue Him And he gradually delivered them from that. And some of them instantaneously, but some of them gradually delivered them from the bondage that held them back. And they never just continued in it because they understood that to continue in it was to expect grace to be some cheap resource just at every beck and call. Need a little grace for that? (laughs) Need a little grace for that? Oh, well, I slipped again. Oh, well, it's just me. That is so cheap. That is so worthless. That's so indicative of a life of a person who really needs Jesus in their life. I told you I was going to start stepping on toes, didn't I? 
That's indicative of a person who needs genuine salvation. Who had something that was a counterfeit. They came to the church and they said the stuff. And they started acting in some certain ways, but they still lived over here in some certain other ways. That's a person who needs salvation. That may be a person who thinks they got salvation, but they don't have a clue what salvation is. Salvation is cleansing. Salvation is healing. Salvation is deliverance. Salvation is a purging of everything that was you until you're not the old person anymore, but you're the new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. We don't get saved in 1979, which was the year that I get, got saved. We don't get saved in 1979 and then in 2021, we're still doing the same dumb stuff we were doing in 1979. We have to at some point realize, I didn't get saved. We have to at some point realize that was religion to me. That was, I was going to church. And had some friends there and some buddies and liked picking the guitar and whatever it is. Well, you know, the, the music was fun and the whatever. But at some point, I got to realize I got to grow beyond this. I got to grow beyond this junk that's in me. And, 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 and maybe I did make a genuine confession, but I need to realize. I need to realize that along with that confession of I need a Savior is the part where the Savior moves in and begins to change me. I don't just need a Savior to just, just tell me I'm saved and I'm, I'm just like I used to be and always was. If Christ ever moves inside of your heart, <laughs> you're going to know it. You're going to know it. If, if you ever have the spirit of the living Christ on the inside of you, you're going to know it. You're not going to want to be like you were. You're not going to want to talk like you did. You're not going to want to participate in the stuff you used to participate in because every situation you go into that was the same old situation like you used to participate in, you're going to have this conviction that's going to come over you. You're going to have a feeling of guilt. You're going to have a feeling of remorse for having participated in it. You're going to have a feeling of, I disappointed the one I love most. And I don't want to do that. And, it, and it's going to drive you to Him for Him to change you. Now, a word of caution. If you ignore that guilt, that remorse, that what we call conviction long enough, it will leave. And you'll still be going to the same church, singing the same pews, hanging on to the same sins and be just as lost as you were before you ever came to Him, if not worse. Live a life worthy of that call. I think I told you wrong on Philippians. Uh, go back to chapter 1. Philippians 1. I'll find it in a minute. Verse 27, Paul says, just one thing. Now, Paul had just been talking to them about how he wanted to advance the gospel, and that was his passion, was that the gospel would be preached to everyone, and that everyone could, that could, would receive that gospel. And he just, he just got through telling them, Brother Bob, that for me to live is, is Christ. In other words, if, to, to live this life is for it to be all about him and none about me. And he was telling him, but, but to die would be gain for me too, but it's better for you that I'm here a little while longer. You know, for, for me, for you, you, for you, some of you out here, some of you ministers, it, it's better for you, really, in the big picture, and, and I'm not about to pass out Kool-Aid, but it's better for you that you die and go home to be with, 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 with your Savior in, in heaven for eternity. That's awesome. That's what we live our life here. I mean, it's like, that's, that's, the, that's the point of this whole thing. So for me, that's better. Take me home. Okay. Woo! Like Henry Wright says, so you die and go to heaven. What's your problem? But for you, it's better that I stay here longer 
so that we can help continue to grow and teach and train and move and draw in and all those things. So that's what Paul was telling them here. And then he says, he says to them, but just one thing, this is verse 27, chapter 127, just one thing, live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then whether I come and see you or whether I'm absent, I will hear about you and that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one mind, working side by side for the faith that comes from the gospel, not being frightened by, by in any way by your opponent, opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but for your deliverance. And this is from God, for it has been given to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, having the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. So he's telling them, live your life in a way that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The truth that is spoken in those words that he shared with us in John 12, he said, I'm not going to condemn you, but the words that I have spoken, they stand in judgment for you. The words that he has spoken that we have as his gospel, those are the words that stand as our judge. And if we measure up to those, we we take our life and we measure against the words of Christ and we see that he is pleased, then we're on a good path. But if we take our life and we measure, Brother Eric, against those words that we see that he has preached, that was the gospel, that was the truth, that was the good news, and that we are, we're walking in a manner that is unworthy of that. We're walking in a manner that, that, that gravitates to sin. We're walking in a manner that gravitates to flesh. We're walking in a manner that compromises with the world. Then that's not worthy of that gospel. And he promises that, that persecution, the, the verse is just below that, promises that persecution is going to come for those people. You're going to be challenged. You're going to be pushed and prodded. You're going to be, uh, there's going to be attempts to, to make you compromise your faith, compromise your stand, compromise your beliefs. And it's small little things here and, and there that, 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 that find their way into your heart that pleases that flesh, that makes it feel good. And those are the things, Chris, we have to be on guard against. And and, and he helps us even with that, Mark. He helps us even with, like I said a moment ago, by bringing that that conviction, by bringing that moment of sorrow or bringing that moment of, of pain when we have done something, walked in a way, gone a direction that we know is displeasing. And, and we want to please him. We want to please him. And again, be careful that that moment doesn't pass, that you take advantage of it, that when he, when he challenges you on your sin or your problem or your iniquity or whatever it may be, that when he challenges you that, you, that you do what is necessary and you say, God, I hear what you're saying. I know that's in your word. I, I, I see that I have walked this way. Thank you for this thing that has, that has caused me to, to want to examine my heart, and now I want to do something about it. Now I want to go get a brother or a sister and I want to confess my faults to them that I might be healed. Now I want to go find somebody that I can get an accountability with. This young lady is going to be baptized today. Girl, that's what this is all about. Your baptism is not about you getting wet. It ain't going to really wash anything off of you unless maybe you got a lot of dirt on you or something, but that's about it. But as far as sins... It's symbolic, and as far as your statement and your, your confession, your profession of the faith, it's going to be in front of a bunch of people that are going to look at you and say, Portia said she wanted to follow Jesus. And if they love you, they will see you at a time maybe when you're not living a life worthy of the calling and of the gospel, and they're going to pull you aside in private, and they're going to say, I see something, and it concerns me. And if I didn't love you, I wouldn't tell you this. Right? And that's going to be from the people that care about you. From the people that don't care about you, they're going to say, oh, it's all right. You, you, you do the best you, could, you can. I mean, you, no, nobody's perfect. Yeah, you're, you're justified. You have a right to feel that way. I mean, they hurt you. You have a right to say those things. That's the person that don't love you. That's the person that don't care about your soul. But the one that cares about your soul, hopefully that's everybody in this room, they're going to they're, they're hear your commitment your profession of faith, 
see your dedication and understand that symbolically you're saying, I want to die to everything that is me and I want to live to everything that is Christ and I want to live a life worthy of his gospel. And I want to put on this side of the scale what balances this side of the scale. He laid his life down. I lay my life down. He gave everything. I give everything. I hold nothing back. I hold nothing back. It's, it's kind of an all in or all out if you look at it. It's, 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 it's really pretty cut and dried, pretty black and white. I don't mean to say, and I don't want anybody to take anything from this that, that you know, there's not grace when we fall that we're supposed to be perfect because that's the furthest thing from what I believe and what I think and I hope I didn't convey that to you but, but it's just that when we fall it's important that we want to get up and if we lose that we've lost too much when we compromise and, and it's going to happen I do it, you're going to do it we're all going to do it we're going to miss the mark. That's what sin actually means. You've, you, it's like you've taken an arrow and you're aiming for a target. and You're aiming for the bullseye, but you're off a degree or two and it causes you to miss the target. It's a missing of the mark. But when I miss that mark, when I miss that target, I want to make it right. I want to change. I don't want to live with this. I want to live a life worthy of the calling, and of the gospel that was Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word today. Pray, Lord, that whatever you wanted said was said, and it found its way into the hearts that were ripe and that were ready to receive, that it made its way to the ears that could hear and that would hear and that want to hear and that desire. And for those, Lord, that maybe are not ready, for that, that there will be a time that these seeds are planted, that the word has been spoken, and that there will be a time when you will cause it to come to fruition in their lives. Pray for all that have heard, all that will receive. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Thank you, guys.